Barry is trained as a, um, as a chemical engineer, right, with a doctorate in science from, from Hopkins. Um, what he's done for the better part of the last two or three decades is that he has been an absolutely tireless advocate around the world on the issue of asbestos, on, specifically on the, the global movement of asbestos from countries like Canada, Russia, Brazil, and the other producer countries into developing countries that are ill-equipped uh, to use it and where the death toll is going to be huge, already is huge, and it's going to be huger in the years ahead. So Barry's going to talk with us this afternoon about this work, which is really frontline public health work in, in the best tradition. And please, please join me in welcoming Barry Castleman. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> uh, I want to first give some background before I start talking about this as a global problem, talking a lot about its history in the United States. Asbestos, uh, for those of you don't, who don't know, is a mineral fiber. It's dug out of the ground and extracted in uh, Canada, Russia, Kazakhstan, Zimbabwe, and Brazil. Uh, large amounts of it used to come from South Africa as well. The mines there closed in 2002, and South Africa is one of the 55 or so countries that have now banned asbestos. Um, the uh, estimated death toll from asbestos use in this country is about 10,000 a year. Globally, uh, the World Health Organization estimates it at about 107,000 deaths a year. Uh, these are caused by the deaths are caused by the inhalation of asbestos fibers. Uh, the the uh, Respirable fibers can cause uh, lung scarring disease, asbestosis, which can be totally disabling or fatal. And uh, it also uh, causes various forms of cancer, including lung cancer, uh, laryngeal cancer, ovarian cancer, and cancers which are uh, referred to as signal tumors for asbestos exposure, mesotheliomas of the pleura and peritoneum. These were extremely rare cancers in in uh, the world, uh, and even their dispute was uh, their existence was disputed as early as, as late as 1960 uh, in a pathology textbook. Uh, but now we have about 3,000 deaths a year from mesothelioma in the United States. The uses of asbestos have been uh, for uh, such things as pipe covering. The most dangerous product probably was thermal insulation. So the uh, insulation that's used to put on hot pipes so that people don't get burned by bumping into them and so that energy losses can be reduced to a minimum. Uh, thermal insulation on pipes and boilers uh, was uh, widely used with asbestos for a long time. And uh, because of the tremendous number of people in the construction trades who were exposed to the dust from this, not just the insulators, but the, all the other trades, the electricians, the carpenters, the plumbers, the pipe fitters, uh, all the other trades who worked alongside of them were uh, stricken with the uh, diseases from breathing the asbestos dust, and that accounts for the toll today. The dust has no warning properties, so it doesn't uh, let the, wor the worker know that it's doing any harm, and the latency for any effects is upwards of five years. So people say they've worked with it for years, and they haven't had a problem, so it must not be a problem for them individually. So this is a challenge to us in public health is to get it across to people that this is a, a lethal material with a delayed onset of its, its symptoms. And that by way of background. Uh, the history of knowledge about asbestos and disease was the subject of my doctoral thesis. And uh, the reason I, way I got into that was because lawyers approached me. I was an independent consultant in the uh, mid to late 1970s and have been ever since. Uh, lawyers explained that they represented people who were dying from asbestos diseases in this country, uh, that they, uh, they explained product liability to me. Uh, this is a marvelous public health device that we have in the United States, which is almost unique in the world, that if you sell a product to the public, you, uh, as a manufacturer, have a duty to uh, know. You, have a, you are presumed to be an expert on the knowledge of the hazards of your product, and you have a duty to warn people uh, about the dangers of the product, to warn what a reasonable person would want to know, uh, so that that person can take the decision of whether or not to use the product and uh, to uh, 
exercise protective measures if they choose to use the product, all, both of which are foregone if people are ignorant of the hazards. And so, uh, so began uh, investigations into the history of everything published on asbestos. And in the meantime, the lawyers started providing me with documents that were coming in from legal discovery. Uh, and I uh, wound up writing this up. This is a now 900-page book called Asbestos, Medical and Legal Aspects. And it, it basically is a, a, t a tribute to the American legal discovery process uh, in the enormous amount of documentation that has been unearthed about the history of what companies in this industry knew and did um, some, since the 1920s about the hazards of asbestos, documents uh, that were never written with it in mind that they would be revealed outside of the company or among the companies that were sharing them. Um, and it's a, it's a grim history. Uh, I mean, one does not find altruism in this history. You, you have the occasional company doc or company industrial hygienist uh, trying to suggest to corporate management that uh, we should do the right thing, we should warn these workers, we should compensate the ones who we've identified as having asbestosis and partly disabled from it. Uh, we should do various other things like that. And always these things are pitched in terms of, in business language, that this may reduce our long-term liabilities, this may reduce concerns about uh, unionized uh, activities and labor unrest that could arise among our workers should they start uh, to become concerned about this. Um, but uh, for the most part, the company doctors and the, and the uh, uh, industrial hygienists writing these memos were regarded as hired help by the people who were running the company, and their suggestions were usually disregarded. And this is what the corporate documents show, the cor corporate documents I've been reading for the last 30 years. So this is something we need to bear in mind as public health workers, we need to know what we're up against. Um, the history of knowledge is that uh, asbestosis was recognized with lung scarring by the lady inspectors of factories in the annual report of the chief inspector of factories in England in the, for the year 1898. The, uh, uh, the disease asbestosis uh, uh, hadn't been recognized as a separate occupational disease by 1918, when a report was published by an insurance industry, insurance industry actuary, uh, a report published by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, noting that it was generally the practice of American and Canadian life insurance companies to not sell life insurance to asbestos workers because they were seen as bad risks. Uh, he had some statistics attributing the deaths to uh, such causes as pneumonia and tuberculosis. But it's interesting that the insurance companies had figured it out even before the disease had a name. And then in the 1920s, the disease asbestosis is described in case reports, uh, the most uh, noteworthy being a report of a woman who died at the age of 33 and was the subject of a report in the British Medical Journal in 1924. Uh, this woman had started work at the age of 13 and become disabled by the time she was 26. Uh, the doctor uh, writing the report described the abnormal uh, chest x-rays, the abnormal uh, pathology of the lung tissues. And this set off uh, concerns around, around the world. There were, and particularly in Britain, the factory inspector had conducted surveys to uh, see the prevalence of asbestosis in people working in the industry making asbestos textiles and other products. Asbestos textiles would be used as things like heat resistant gloves for use in the steel industry or the aluminum industry where people were handling hot objects or working around splashing metals, things like that. Uh, and they found that 26 percent of the people they examined had asbestosis in this survey and none of the people with less than five years had asbestosis. There were 89 of those. So uh, this was very uh, clear uh, demonstration of what Dr. Merriweather, the author of the report, called a maturation period that this disease had, that people didn't get sick right away no matter how massive their exposure was. And uh, Merriweather also called for workers to be educated to a sane appreciation of the risk. That was in 1930. In 1930, in the early 30s, cases were reported of people dying with asbestosis with the durations of exposure as short as six months. Um, there were also cases starting to be reported in asbestos product users like insulation workers, cases in 
uh, asbestos office workers and asbestos factories, not just the production workers. And so the population at risk is getting larger and larger as you see the construction workers falling victims to this disease. Suddenly, instead of uh, thousands of workers in the factories making the products being the population at risk, you've got, in addition, millions of workers in the construction trades. And this was all evident in the 1930s. And it, this, during the same decade, the first cases of lung cancer in combination with asbestosis were published in the literature. And by 1938, a German author titled his paper, The Occupational Cancer of Asbestos Workers. German pathologists would uh, uh, never dispute this after 1938, and there would be many more cases published in the German literature. It would also be German pathologists who first identified pleural mesothelioma as an asbestos disease in 1943 and peritoneal mesothelioma as an asbestos disease in 1954. Uh, there were, uh, lung cancer was sufficiently recognized as an asbestos disease to be noted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Scientific American, and Newsweek by 1950. Uh, there was a legendary figure who came along during this era, the stone age of industrial medicine in America, which continued into, until the 1970s. There was no government regulation. There was no EPA. There was no OSHA before the 1970s. Those of you who are under 50 should bear that in mind if it's news to you. Uh, there was, it was open season on the workers and the environment in this country. And any, whatever the companies knew about the hazards of asbestos, there wasn't anybody making them spend a dollar to protect workers or the environment from these toxic threats. And uh, there was this guy named Dr. Irving Selikoff at Mount Sinai who came along, started working with the unions, uh, got the confidence of the insulation workers union, did a mortality study on the workers in New York and New Jersey, locals in the union, documented their appalling mortality from occupational cancers and asbestosis. Uh, and this had not been done uh, on an epidemiological mortality uh, type of study. And, uh, but Selikoff didn't content himself with publishing this in the journal of the American Medical Association. He organized a major conference in New York. Uh, it was held at the Waldorf Astoria in October of 1964 for three days, they had experts presenting uh, papers on uh, asbestos and disease. Uh, one of the more noteworthy papers was by Muriel Newhouse and Hilda Thompson, describing an epidemiology study they did in which they identified 76 cases of mesothelioma in a major London hospital. The people had all died. Uh, they went to the surviving relatives for histories of exposure to asbestos and interviewed them. They uh, picked 76 control patients who were sick in some uh, hospitalized situation, uh, people of the same age and uh, gender as the uh, mesothelioma patients at the time of their death, and questioned those people as a comparison population. They found a statistically significant association with occupational exposure to asbestos in the mesothelioma group compared to the controls. Putting that aside, they found a statistically significant association with household contact exposure to asbestos in the mesothelioma population. They were the brothers, the sisters, the wives, the children, the daughter, uh, you know, the, the, the relatives who lived in the household, and that was the only source of their exposure, the worker coming home with the dust on his clothes, on his hair, on his shoes, on his lunchbox, and contaminating the living environment. And then if you put that aside, the occupational and household exposure, uh, they found that neighborhood exposure to asbestos was also statistically significantly increased in the mesothelioma group compared to the controls. Uh, many more of them had lived within a half mile radius of an asbestos air pollution point source among the mesothelioma patients. So this was stunning evidence for the appalling uh, threat that this constituted to society at large. Uh, and they didn't even look at all the people who were buying asbestos products in hardware stores. When I testified at a Senate hearing in 1973, I brought in a, a five pound sack of asbestos that I had just bought in a hardware store. The mark on the bag said 89 cents. That's all it said. And this is the way things were at, at the time of the era of regulation that was just starting with the creation of the EPA and OSHA and the creation of more space for occupational and environmental health professionals who didn't work for the man. The whole field was dominated by industry, 
prior to the 1970s. The journals were, uh, I mean, the, Ameri the, the Journal of Occupational Medicine, people like me used to joke, it would call it the Journal of Negative Epidemiology. They never found any problems in that journal. The editors were company doctors from the big chemical companies and Johns Manville. Uh, and Selikoff broke that monopoly, creating something called the American Journal of Industrial Medicine in 1980, which rapidly became the most respected journal of its kind in the world, and uh, is still around. Dr. Landrigan uh, edited it for many years. Uh, the, uh, and, but Selikoff, uh, in, in, uh, another thing about Selikoff was he, he was very willing to talk to the media, unlike so many doctors. And uh, he spoke in sound bites. The media loved Selikoff. Um, he spoke in plain English. He really saw this as part of his mission to try and raise public awareness and get people to understand about things like asbestos. And uh, uh, I remember one journalist talking to me saying, uh, well, I, I asked Selikoff, uh, I said, well, the industry people say this, this talk, this talk about asbestos, this is all emotional. And Selikoff, looked at him and he said, well, most forms of cancer, we don't know how to prevent, but some of it we do. And he said, I get emotional about preventable cancer that's not prevented. And he said that in such a powerful way. I mean, on camera, I mean, and Selikoff always knew the answers. It was never, I'll get back to you in an hour or a day with the journalists. He understood they wrote on deadline and he could just, he was just, fluent in dealing with the media and, and in getting things across to people in, in plain terms. Uh, so the EPA and OSHA and uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration came along. They created new duties and obligations for industry. Uh, uh, regulations on the industry uh, were raising the cost of asbestos in the United States and uh, uh, it, it occurred to me at some point that maybe they're going to be uh, avoiding regulation by moving to Mexico or someplace to manufacture these products and they won't have to worry about the EPA and OSHA down there and they can still sell the products in the United States. And sure enough, I saw there were government statistics on asbestos textiles uh, showing a, an astounding increase of imports in asbestos textiles starting in 1969, uh, but really uh, rising fast uh, after 1970, 1971 coming in from Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, and Taiwan. And with a little more diligence, I was able to learn that one of uh, the main source in Mexico were two asbestos factories operated by a company from the United States with a horrendous record uh, of death and disease in, in uh, its plants here. They had actually built a new plant in uh, Pennsylvania in 1967. By 1972, everything had changed. They closed that plant down, packed it up, and moved it to Agua Prieta and set it up in Mexico across the border from Douglas, Arizona, one mile over the border or less. I visited that plant in 1977, and the dust was hanging. They had so much fiber asbestos hanging on the fence that you could hardly see the peligro sign. Peligro means danger. Uh, and the company never did do interviews with the media about uh, why they were running these two asbestos plants. Uh, in Mexican border towns. They simply didn't have any plausible, deniable explanation for why they were doing that. Uh, so I started investigating the export of hazardous factories to developing countries. Uh, oh, just uh, this is a picture from Pakistan today. Um, the main problem today is that as about 90% of all the asbestos is used in asbestos cement sheets and pipes in developing countries. Uh, and this is a typical piece of roofing type material, this corrugated asbestos cement sheet. You see this gray roofs all over the third world. And this is in Pakistan. And you can see uh, the, the guy's hair is actually white with asbestos in front, the guy holding that power saw. Uh, and you see the fragments of the material just all around and children and people all around. This is, this is, the, way, this is the way it's, it is out there. No respirators. No respirators. I mean, there's no awareness. I mean, look at this kid. This picture was taken 30 years ago. Uh, these are asbestos cement pipes. And it's right outside. And these are fragments of asbestos all around. And this is, uh, this is in uh, Ahmedabad in India. And the plant was... Uh, uh, 
called Sri Digvijay Cement Company. It was uh, uh, built by Johns Manville from the United States in 1962 and 1963, according to the Bombay Stock Exchange Directory. JM owned 10% of the stock. They had an exclusive license to market the products in Africa and the Middle East. And of course, their asbestos fiber from Canada was used in the manufacture of uh, the product. I showed these pictures to the vice president of Johns Manville in 1980, and he said, that's criminal. I put that in the article I wrote about it at the, in New Scientist 30 years ago. But I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, well, we'll stop selling asbestos to that factory. I said, well, you sell asbestos in factories in 55 countries. What do you expect me to do, come back with pictures on every one? This is obviously going on all over the place. This is a, a, a you see the, the products of the factory nicely displayed here in the home of this worker who lives near the plant in Ahmedabad. Asbestos cement pipes of different uh, diameters and the corrugated roofing sheets. And these are waste fragments that are sort of bailed together for some place for someone to live. Well, eventually, the World Health Organization did something about this. The reasons for that being so delayed were partly because of uh, uh, the involvement of Canada as the leading exporter of asbestos for many years. Up until around 1999, Canada was the world's largest exporter of asbestos. And they were all over the WHO and the ILO and these international bodies, uh, keeping them from really doing much about this. And finally, in 2006, the World Health Organization, actually it was the ILO that came first, uh, in the summer of 2006 said that asbestos should be banned all over the world, that we should stop building the, the next 100 years of infrastructure out of this stuff, that people are going to be sawing and drilling and cutting uh, for the next 100 years. Uh, we should make it out of safer alternative materials. Uh, the ILO said that in 2006. Uh, uh, the World Health Organization followed about a month later, uh, publishing a, uh, a, a short a paper saying that uh, this, is, this is what we think uh, should be done for the elimination of asbestos-related disease, and one of the things they called for were bans on asbestos all over the world. By this time, asbestos had been banned in uh, probably 30 to 40 countries. The World Bank, uh, uh, at, one, at some point I decided uh, maybe we should try and do something more at the World Bank, and so I, uh, I, I World Bank, uh, uh, a retired expert from environmental uh, part of the World Bank had written a, a consultant report to the bank at the end of 2003 saying uh, they should support bans all over the world and stop using asbestos in all of their uh, construction projects that they finance. Uh, and I contacted him. I said, well, how can we get him to do something about that, really follow what you advised? And he said, well, maybe you can write an opinion piece in a newspaper or, uh, get it published and then go to the World Bank with that. And I said, okay. So I wrote up the global asbestos struggle in 700 words, got it published in the Washington Post a couple weeks after the 2004 elections, and sent that um, from the Natural Resources Defense Council, a leading environmental group uh, that I work with, uh, uh, to a couple vice presidents of the World Bank in 2005, and they didn't answer us. So a year went by. and. Uh, then, uh, some, then the old-timer from the World Bank called me up and he said somebody he knew was, had just gotten hired as the green person for the procurement branch of the World Bank, call her up. So I called her up and she was very receptive. And uh, we sat down and talked and then a couple months later she hired me to write a guidance document for the World Bank. And uh, anyway, that got finally published in 2009. So it basically talks about alternatives for asbestos cement construction materials and uh, uh, about the safeguards you need to apply if you're renovating structures where the asbestos is already in place. Uh, I was a little optimistic talking about the country bans listing Ecuador. Uh, the Minister of Health announced that they were going to ban asbestos, but then the asbestos industry got to work, and I think that that's now been put on hold. Uh, Turkey has most recently announced a ban on asbestos. Uh, uh, in many countries, uh, we, we have found that we didn't need to mount a social movement uh, because the European Union had uh, required as part of uh, conditions for membership that there be bans on asbestos in place as of 2005. 
and so we got asbestos banned in Lithuania and a few other places without having to mount a social movement. And uh, similarly in Turkey, uh, because they want to join the European Union, they have just banned asbestos. Um, the last of the global asbestos corporations uh, was uh, Saint Gobain. Uh, they operated uh, asbestos mines in Brazil uh, as late as 1999. Uh, they operated asbestos cement plants in Brazil. Saint Gobain is a French company, uh, a French multinational corporation, and asbestos was banned in France in 1997. And so uh, the leader of the asbestos effort in Brazil, an extraordinary activist and uh, public health worker named Fernanda Genasi, uh, was really uh, beating them up pretty badly in the media over double standards and the export of hazards. And uh, finally, Saint Gobain, uh, also nicknamed the saint of occupational cancer in Brazil, decided that they would stop selling asbestos. They are now our new friends. They want asbestos to be banned in Brazil. They are making fiber cement using polypropylene fibers and cellulose, but it costs a little bit more to make products with that compared to the asbestos, assuming, of course, that all of the costs of using asbestos can be externalized to the society rather than borne on the balance sheet of the manufacturers. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting that we now have uh, allies uh, involving, including companies that used to be uh, our, our adversaries, the global asbestos industry. <laughs> we now have uh, companies like Sengoban on our side to try and get asbestos banned in Brazil. And uh, 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 Everite was their, a similar company in South Africa that made asbestos cement for a long time. They converted to using uh, uh, polyvinyl alcohol. I'll get, I'll get to China in a minute. Uh, they, they changed to polyvinyl alcohol and cellulose fibers, again, at a 10 or 15% increase in cost in production. And so now uh, they are our new friends in trying to get asbestos banned, and they were very instrumental in getting asbestos banned in South Africa, our former uh, adversaries uh, from the asbestos industry. Of course, they don't want to compensate all the people that they've killed with asbestos. We still have some dispute about that with these companies. Um, and there are some multinational corporations, such as Dow and Unilever and ICI, that have uh, incorporated rules for uh, not using asbestos in new construction and uh, being careful if they have to renovate structures where there's already asbestos in place. Unfortunately, I have not been able to coax any of those companies into sharing publicly that what their guidelines are uh, on uh, their, their, their global asbestos policies. Uh, Canada, uh, just by way of mentioning China, by way of answering the question, China and India are the major users of asbestos in the world today in that order. Uh, China mines uh, a large amount of asbestos, but they use it all and they import some additionally. The use of asbestos is going up dramatically in China and in India, uh, despite uh, what we have been able to do so far. And I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, Canada is a key country because Canada has been leading the uh, effort to uh, uh, legitimize the, the, the asbestos business all these years and, and to keep the uh, international organizations I've mentioned from, from doing anything. Uh, and so Canada is still very important. Canada now has a conservative national government and the government in Quebec uh, where the asbestos mines are is also, has also been very solidly behind uh, the asbestos business. Uh, about a year ago, we were down to one asbestos mine that was almost mined out in Canada. It had maybe one more year or two left in it. It employed 340 workers, and we thought we were almost done with Canada. And uh, I mean, if we can get Canada out of this business and the Canadian asbestos propaganda team out of the business of going around the world and going to India and elsewhere with their marketing plans and, and they're using the Canadian Embassy, you know, as, as a place to, to show off how safe asbestos is, we could accomplish a great deal. We could put asbestos in the ashtray with the tobacco industry because the Russians can't do the kind of job of selling asbestos that the Canadians have done all these years. So the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, did a documentary called Canada's Ugly Secret. 
that got into an asbestos plant in India. I'll show you some pictures from that. Uh, they got workers picking up asbestos and just moving it across the floor with the dust flying all over their shoulders and the, and the guys wearing a, 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 a bandana, uh, which is totally useless for protecting you against respirable sized dust. Uh, and the workers are probably totally unaware of any danger associated with asbestos. Uh, the leader of the Liberal Party, the opposition in Canada, uh, was uh, doing, a, uh, doing a town hall talk. And uh, he was accosted by these six women calling themselves the Raging Grannies. They came as, as demonstrators carrying placards, handing out leaflets. They were women who were about 60 years old. Uh, they, uh, the, one of them asked uh, the leader of the opposition at the end, after he had puffed himself up with some human rights question, uh, uh, what about uh, shipping asbestos out to the poor countries of the world? You're spending millions of dollars to remove it from the parliament buildings where you guys work. And he said, uh, I'm probably stepping off a cliff here, but I don't think we should sell it to other countries if we don't use it ourselves. And uh, he stuck with that. And so that torpedoed the deal that the Chinese investors were about to do to buy Canadian asbestos mines. Uh, the Canadian Cancer Society, the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Public Health Association have all called for a ban on asbestos. Uh, the Quebec Premier then, a year ago, a little less than a year ago, floats this idea of a, a $58 million loan to reopen the Johns Manville mine, the big asbestos mine in Quebec. Uh, that had been run by the big asbestos company from the United States for many years. And, uh, and only this time with Indian investors who's, who are totally undisclosed. The only guy whose name is disclosed is this front man, uh, an Indo-Canadian businessman who's been in the asbestos export business for at least 15 years. Uh, and so uh, we had to organize demonstrations all over the world in Washington, New York, Hong Kong, Seoul, Brussels, London, Paris. And then also the Environmental Health Perspectives, a journal published by the uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services in this country, the most widely read journal of its kind in the world, published an issue on asbestos. They had uh, the, the cover, the, an editorial by the head of the National Institute for Environmental Health Services, an article written by 16 of us. Uh, they had a news article as well. A journalist basically interviewed people all over the world, mostly activists, talking about what was going on in India and all these other countries. And uh, so this picked up a lot of press coverage in Canada. And uh, then uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Uh, this is the way investigative journalists are trying to save investigative journalism in this country with the media going down the tubes, uh, especially because of Craigslist, I think. They, they don't, can't sell classified ads like they used to, so they don't have the money to operate investigative journalism. So the investigative journalists got a grant from a foundation to do an asbestos project. They've got people in all these countries. They sent them in, and they came back with these stories. And after nine months, they were by this time paired up with the BBC and getting a, a huge ride on the publicity that they put out. And this got a lot more coverage in Canada, and it came out again, within a month of the time that they were going to announce, that they announced that they were going to go ahead with this $58 million public loan, which would never be repaid. They call it a loan, but they'd never see that money again, uh, to reopen the Johns Manville, the big mine that uh, Johns Manville had it in a town called Asbestos, Quebec. Um, and then the Quebec Premier went on a trade mission to India early last, last year and was uh, assailed by demonstrators over the asbestos issue, unionists and uh, activists, uh, asbestos victims, and this, this got more press in Canada, and we were getting more and more press in, in Quebec where it matters, because they could care less about English Canada. But uh, this was happening in, in the French-speaking media in Quebec, that finally this issue was starting to get picked up in a big way. Uh, the town of asbestos, uh, uh, got mad at the Canadian Cancer Society and pulled out of the Relay for Life uh, last year. That was a fundraiser that the Canadian Cancer Society did, but the, the, the mayor of Asbestos Quebec was in a snit over their position on asbestos, so he, he canceled that. Um, 
local health officers from all over Quebec have, have, have publicly said that the asbestos business should be shut down. These are things that never happened before. This has all happened within the last few months. And the Canadian government uh, finally discontinued funding the propaganda arm, the Chrysotile Institute, you formerly called the Asbestos Institute. And then the Quebec, der Quebec Director of Occupational Safety is now being urged by people writing letters all over the world to not certify the safe use of asbestos for India. He's over going over to India for that. Uh, and, but the biggest thing within the last week was that the uh, confederation of uh, the biggest union confederation in Quebec finally spoke up against this. Up until now, the only union voices have been those who were pro-asbestos in Quebec. And so this was a tremendous victory. And this uh, union federation has said that no worker's life, whether Indian or Quebecois, should be sacrificed for a job. So it's great that there are people out there doing these kinds of things. Um, I think we're going to win in Canada. I wouldn't have put the odds at above 50% two weeks ago, even with everything that's gone on over the past year. So this is part of what they were, the Canadians would do. You see the Canadian flag. And this is a, one of these propaganda shows they set up at, uh, four years, five years ago in Jakarta to sell asbestos in Indonesia. And uh, it's, it's just the government of Canada and, and the asbestos industry. Uh, and uh, the head of occupational health for the country tried to get involved in organizing this program, uh, and, and they just uh, told her to get lost. Uh, she, she was a progressive person who, who wanted there to be some balance in the, in the program, but that, that, that wasn't what they were interested in. Barry, yeah. point out the asbestos, because some people here have probably never seen asbestos. Oh, yeah. Um, this is... Asbestos fiber is kind of a, uh, literally, it's a, it's a rock, but it's fiber shaped. And so because of that, and it has tremendous tensile strength. So it's, it's been used in brake linings and, uh, and, and in other products. It adds strength to the pipe, the asbestos cement pipe. Although there are alternatives, uh, they're not fiber alternatives in a cement, not for the pipe, they, but there's clay pipe, there's cast iron pipe, there's uh, plastic pipe of various types that can be used. And there are similarly many substitutes for asbestos cement sheets, including fiber cement products made with non-asbestos fibers, which I've talked about. And so the activists, uh, you know, the internet's been a great help to us. Uh, we've organized an international conference in Brazil. Uh, starting in 2000, we've had uh, uh, similar conferences uh, held in Athens, Tokyo, Seoul, Hong Kong over the past 10 years uh, and trying to get the, the people together, uh, scientists, uh, public health workers, doctors, lawyers, politicians, journalists, uh, anybody who can have a piece of this action uh, in any country and uh, then to provide information uh, from experts if they need ex information on, on medical help, on medical issues, on industrial hygiene, to provide them with that kind of expertise. Uh, but you have to have a base some, in every country. You, you can't, foreigners from, from outside a country aren't going to be able to do anything unless there are people in the country that, that care enough to do something about this themselves. Uh, the, America, the Asbestos Diseases Awareness Organization links activists now using social networking media. I don't pretend to understand this very well, but uh, it's obviously something that we need to be doing. Uh, and uh, so let's go on. The industry, of course, uh, has uh, ways to fight back, uh, uh, but we're, we're, dealing with, we're dealing with some very ruthless characters here. These are the people that bought in when the multinationals got out. And they figure, this is our country. We can still make plenty of money selling this stuff. And nobody's going to tell us how to run our business. And uh, they don't have the same sensitivity about their corporate image that uh, multinational corporations that preceded them might have had. Uh, the, uh, there are industry groups and trade associations uh, around the world that work together. The, the Canadians kind of wrote the, wrote the book on how to, you know, how to do this. but. Uh, it's been picked up by similar groups in Mexico and Colombia and Russia. And they, you know, they pay for these ads in the media and places like the Times of India. And they still have a few scientists who publish articles that try to argue that, asbestos, that chrysotile asbestos, which has been used for 
95% of all the asbestos in the last century and is the only type of asbestos used in the world today is safe. And it's the other kind of asbestos that causes all the disease. Uh, this has not been accepted by any of the international bodies or the national authorities in this country as being credible. Uh, and they raise fears about asbestos substitutes, saying that they haven't been adequately studied. But in fact, the fiber substitutes for asbestos cement, the polyvinyl alcohol, the poly uh, propylene fibers and the cellulose fibers are all non-respirable. So I don't think we have to worry too much about people getting cancers of the lung and pleura from fibers that are too big to get into the lungs. Um, and they accuse people like me and all the other critics of working for competitive industries and I've never seen any, any uh, basis for any of this. Uh, it's always been um, people motivated by public health concerns who've been con criticizing the asbestos industry as you might expect. So now just, whoops, uh, there was supposed to be another one. Oh, well, I was going to show you some pictures, uh, but I guess it's uh, maybe not connected or needs to be reworked in some way. So it was a video or a slide? It's just slides. Really? But they're just pictures. Was it a separate file? Yeah, it was sent as a you separate. Have to separate file. Did you send it to me? Yeah. And then I sent it to Jennifer. Okay. Let me just uh, mention one other thing. Uh, the, uh, in, in India, where we've, we've tried, <laughs> but so far not had much success in turning around the uh, rate of asbestos use, uh, there have recently been demonstrations in, in the state of Bihar where uh, it, it turns out, according to the BBC story, that students were reading about the dangers of asbestos in their school books. And uh, the town was slated to have a couple of new asbestos cement plants constructed. And, the, uh, and this is where people were already living. Uh, and the kids started talking to their parents about this. And by the time they got done, there were hundreds of people demonstrating against the building of these asbestos plants. And the kids were being quoted in the media saying, if they want to build the asbestos factories, first they should burn our school books and tell us that those were lies. And so it's really been powerful politically to have these, these kids being involved. These are, these are teenagers. Uh, and, and these communities demonstrating. The cops were you know, breaking heads at the demonstrations. People were hospitalized. It was getting pretty nasty. And the media coverage was getting heavier and heavier in India, and this is all within the last several months that this has been going on. And uh, the, the state authorities in Bihar were actually backed off enough to say that uh, they felt that uh, this is an issue that should be decided by the national government, whether to ban asbestos. But they weren't running away from the idea. They weren't dismissing it. They were simply saying that uh, the national government should really make a decision on this for the whole country rather than leaving it to the individual states all over the country to deal with uh, as, as a problem or, or as a, 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 an issue of economic competitiveness and migration of hazards. So we may be... Uh, so we got this one file. Oh, Did you have another copy? There was another file. Okay, well, if we don't have the pictures, we'll just do without them. Do you want to open your email account that you sent it to us with? And it might be oh, it's, oh, I think I'd rather just okay. take questions. Okay. We're pretty late. Okay. But anyway, I just wanted to show you some, some, some more pictures. But they'd be, just be pictures of the demonstrations I've told you about, uh, both the ones that we organized in protest and the ones that they had in this town uh, that, that were led by these children. So uh, um, you look like a great group. I've really enjoyed being with you this morning. Uh, and, and I hope there are plenty of troublemakers out there who are going to not be silent witnesses to the rape of the world. Uh, if you have some questions, please uh, come to the microphone, and we can probably take a few.